I will be talking to you this morning about blood gas surrogates. And by blood gas surrogates, I mean things like pulse oximetry and capnography and transcutaneous PCO2. A lot of my presentation will relate to pulse oximetry because there has been a lot of renewed interest just in recent years as to the accuracy of pulse oximetry. And it was shown, for example, during COVID that there were many patients who had occult hypoxemia or undetected hypoxemia because of inaccuracies related to pulse oximetry. So I'll talk a bit about that this morning. And then also talk about end tidal PCO2 and transcutaneous. So these are this morning's objectives to discuss the accuracy of pulse oximetry. Some of you may be surprised that it's not as accurate as you might have once thought that it was. To describe the physiologic determinants of end tidal PCO2 and to compare end tidal PCO2 to transcutaneous PCO2. And Jason, do you want to run the timer? Otherwise, I'll be talking till 11. <laughs> Here are my disclosures, exactly the same as they were yesterday. So let's talk for a bit about the accuracy of pulse oximetry. So let's consider that you might want to do a study where you will evaluate the accuracy of any pulse oximeter. So the gold standard reference will be an arterial oxygen saturation measured by co-oximetry in the blood gas laboratory. So you gather together a number of individuals. They may be normal individuals. They may be individuals in the hospital. And you compare 100 pulse oximeter saturations to the saturation from a co-oximeter. And these are all the data that you collect. So now, how do you analyze those data to determine whether the pulse oximeter is accurate? Well, there are some relatively simple statistics that are done. All of these can be done with a spreadsheet, so relatively straightforward. So what you would do is take all of those 100 samples and you would calculate something called the bias, which is the mean difference between the oxygen saturation by the pulse oximeter and by the co-oximeter. And then you would calculate the precision, which is the standard deviation of those differences. So straightforward basic statistics that perhaps many of us learned about as undergraduates. And then we calculate the limits of agreement, or I would say the limits of accuracy, as the bias plus or minus the precision, two standard deviations. And if you do that for the data that I just showed, and if you do that for many pulse oximeters, you will find that pulse oximeters typically have an accuracy of about plus or minus 4%, with a bias of zero, and a precision or a standard deviation of 2%. So plus or minus 4% on the surface may seem like not so bad, pretty good, but we're going to show in a minute where that maybe is not as accurate as you once thought that it was. You can also display that data on this type of a graph. So on the y-axis, we're looking at the difference between the pulse oximeter and the co-oximeter. On the x-axis, we're looking at the average of the two measurements. Here are all those 100 data points I showed a few slides ago. The bias on average is pretty good, close to zero. So on average, the pulse oximeter and the co-oximeter are about the same. <clears throat> However, the limits of agreement, which is most important for accuracy, is about plus or minus 4%. And that's actually what it typically is for the pulse oximeters that we all use every day in our practice. Now, something that makes all of this extremely confusing, as though you're not confused already, 
is that the FDA requires reporting of accuracy as something called the root mean square. I venture to guess that none of you in this room has ever heard of a root mean square. But if a manufacturer says the accuracy of their pulse oximeter is two, they are saying two root mean square because that's what the FDA requires. Well, what does that mean? Well, the root mean square is a calculation that incorporates both the bias and precision as we have already defined. So if a pulse oximeter has a bias, a mean difference between the pulse oximeter and the co-oximeter, if it has a bias of zero and a precision of two, just like the example I showed previously, the root mean square is two. So the manufacturer will say, our pulse oximeter has an accuracy of two, accuracy root mean square. But that translates into a true accuracy, twice the precision of plus or minus 4%. So that pulse oximeter that is on the label, an accuracy of two, actually has a range of accuracy of plus or minus 4% if we think about what is meant by the root mean square and bias and precision and so forth. So then I think there's a disconnect between manufacturers' claims and clinical reality. This confuses us, right? Because nobody's ever heard of a root mean square. Nobody knows what it means. But if you see the accuracy and root mean square, you need to double that in order to see the true accuracy of the pulse oximeter. So then what are the implications of an accuracy of plus or minus 4%? Well, to appreciate that, we need to think a little bit about some physiology. We need to think about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve that we all learned about in school and probably don't think about very much in our day-to-day -day practice. So here is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And let's say that your pulse oximeter is reading out a saturation of 95%. We now know that the pulse oximeter saturation of 95% is a true arterial saturation between 91 and 99. At a saturation of 91, the PO2 is about 60. At a saturation of 99, the PO2 is about 115. So that pulse oximeter reading of 95% could translate into a wide range of PO2s. Moreover, think about this. Oh, and that is that the pulse oximeter cannot detect hyperoxemia. So if the pulse oximeter is reading out a saturation of 100, the PO2 could be, be 100, the PO2 could be 1,000. Not going to be 1,000 unless you're in a hyperbaric chamber. But my point is that the pulse oximeter is not a very good determinant of hyperoxemia. It might not be as good of a determinant of hypoxemia as we once thought. Moreover, we need to remember that the relationship between saturation and PO2 is not constant. There are shifts to the left and the right of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve by a number of things, not the least of which is pH. So let's imagine that your patient has a PO2 of 60. That translates into an oxygen saturation of 90% with a pH of 7.40. So on the pulse oximeter, let's imagine that the saturation is 90%, PO2 is 60. But now what happens if the patient becomes acidemic? As you might remember, with acidosis, the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve shifts to the left, to the right. It goes from the orange graph to the blue graph. So that now for the same PO2, the oxygen saturation will drop from 90% to 85%. So if you're at the bedside, the only thing you're monitoring is the pulse oximeter. If the saturation drops from 90 to 85, what would you think? My patients become hypoxemic. I need to increase the FiO2. I need to adjust the PEEP. But in reality, that drop in oxygen saturation might be because your patient became more acidemic.
So when you're evaluating that oxygen saturation at the bedside, maybe it's not as simple as you once thought that it was. Maybe it requires you to think a little bit about the physiology, oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, and also potential inaccuracies in the technology. This is from a paper that we published in Respiratory Care just a few months ago. This was a study that was done in an ICU in a hospital in Quebec, Canada. And here what they did was they looked at the accuracy of four different commonly used pulse oximeter, oximeters in stable patients in the ICU. And these are the kinds of graphs that I showed before, showing bias, showing precision. So the dotted lines are the limits of agreement. The solid lines here are the bias. But the biggest thing that I want to point out from these data is that the devices perform differently. All of the devices have different bias and different precision. So the accuracy of one pulse oximeter does not line up with the accuracy of another device. So if you use one device one day to evaluate a patient's oxygenation, and then you use another device another day, there could be differences in the accuracy between those devices. All of the devices showed imprecision, and the imprecision, the scatter and all these data points suggest that the pulse oximeter might not even be that great for trending because the imprecision is likely not stable over time. So then that means that in practice, you can't compare a pulse oximeter saturation with a blood gas saturation at one point in time and then assume that that difference that you find is stable over time. And also in this study, they showed that over the four different brands of oximeters, pulse oximeters that they evaluated, the oxygen saturation by pulse oximetry is again within about plus or minus 4% of the true arterial oxygen saturation. So, if you don't take anything else home from what I say this morning, bear in mind that when you look at the monitor and you see the pulse oximeter saturation, the true arterial saturation is probably within 4% higher and 4% lower. And that can have important clinical implications when we think about the relationship between oxygen saturation and PO2. There are also data that suggest that we need to be careful about the use of pulse oximetry in patients with COPD exacerbation. That patient who comes into your emergency department with a COPD exacerbation, there's this study, there are other studies that have shown that the pulse oximeter can overestimate the true arterial oxygen saturation by a lot. So your patient, what that means is your patient might be hypoxemic and you will not detect that by the pulse oximeter. And there is this very interesting data just published in the annals of the American Thoracic Society, published just within the last couple of months, re-examining the accuracy of pulse oximetry for long-term oxygen therapy assessment for patients with COPD. And what they did was a retrospective single center analysis of paired saturation measurements and blood gas, pulse oximeter saturation measurements and blood gases. These were stable patients with COPD who were being evaluated for long-term oxygen therapy. And as we know, in patients with COPD, with hypoxemia, who are placed on long-term oxygen therapy, that affords a survival benefit for patients. They live longer if they get oxygen. But before they get oxygen, 
we need to show that they are hypoxemic enough to qualify for oxygen. Well, in this study, they found that the prevalence of severe resting hypoxemia was about 74 out of 518 patients, about 4, uh, 14%. But 52, 52 of the 74 measurements missed, missed severe resting hypoxemia by pulse oximetry. And 2.5% of the patients had an oxygen saturation greater than 92% despite that their true arterial oxygen saturation was less than 88%. So that's occult hypoxemia, missing hypoxemia by pulse oximetry. Using, and the authors concluded that using pulse oximetry alone led to missed hypoxemia in about two-thirds of patients with severe resting hypoxemia and 10% of patients who underwent evaluation for long-term oxygen therapy. So why is that important again? Well, the reason why that is important is that long-term oxygen therapy in patients with COPD and hypoxemia is life prolonging. It has a survival benefit. And if we, if we do not provide oxygen therapy for those patients because the pulse oximeter overreads the true oxygen saturation, we withhold a therapy from a patient which is life prolonging, life saving. Moreover, Another very recently published paper, this was in intensive care medicine just published a few months ago. They looked at real world evidence challenges related to hypoxemia guidelines in patients with, in critically ill patients with COPD. So typically what I have taught for many years and what you have probably practiced and taught yourself is that in patients with COPD exacerbation, we should maintain the oxygen saturation between 88 and 92%. And I suspect that that's probably how many of you uh, practice targeting COPD exacerbation, oxygen saturation, 88 to 92%. Well, what this study showed was that as a result of the overestimation, excuse me, of the, uh, of the overestimation of oxygen saturation by the pulse oximeter, that their, that target range, 88 to 92 percent, might result in a number of patients being hypoxemia, hypoxemic. And they suggest that the optimal pulse oximeter oxygen saturation range should be 94 to 98 percent. And in fact, targeting an oxygen saturation of 88 to 92% resulted in excessive mortality. So if we are using pulse oximetry to assess oxygenation in patients with COPD exacerbation, we should raise our target. No longer 88 to 92%, but rather 94 to 98% because of the tendency of the pulse oximeter to overestimate the oxygen saturation. So there are a number of potential limitations uh, to pulse oximetry. There are a number of things that can affect the accuracy of pulse oximetry. This is the type of table that you can see in a textbook. This happens to be a table out of one of my textbooks showing all of the factors that can affect the accuracy of pulse oximetry. We already talked about the accuracy being about plus or minus 4%. And something that has, we have not yet talked about, which has received a lot of attention over recent years, is the effect of skin pigmentation on inaccuracy of pulse oximetry. This is something that was has been known for many years, has probably been known for 30 years. However, this was brought to light during the pandemic in which it was shown that there were a number of individuals with deeply pigmented skin and whom the pulse oximeter 
uh, overestimated the oxygen saturation. The patients were hypoxemic despite an adequate pulse oximeter saturation, and that might have led to some poorer outcomes. There were a number of studies that looked at this. This is one study from JAMA Internal Medicine published last year showing that there is a high incidence of occult hypoxemia related to the use of, pulse ox of a pulse oximeter. Uh, what this means is the pulse oximeter, again, tends to overestimate the oxygen saturation so that there were will be patients who will have a true saturation will be much lower who will be hypoxemic, occult hypoxemia, despite a pulse oximeter saturation that might be okay. And in the box here shows where the oxygen saturation by pulse oximeter overestimates the true oxygen saturation. And it was shown in this study that the, uh, the inaccuracy was uh, worst for those who are Asian, also not so good for blacks, better but not so good for Hispanics. And I would point out that even for individuals with white skin, it wasn't all that great. So the issue of skin pigmentation and inaccuracy may be worse for individuals with deeply pigmented skin. But these data would show that it's also not so good for individuals who are white skinned. Here is uh, another study that looked at this. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine, where they showed again that uh, the issue of occult hypoxemia, patients being hypoxemic despite a pulse oximeter saturation, that may be okay. Again, showing that this was more severe in individuals with deeply pigmented skin, black patients, than it was with white patients. But as you can see, there is a lot of occult hypoxemia, even for white patients. So it is worse for blacks, but it is not as good as we once thought it was, even for whites. And in fact, these are uh, some, some data from that JAMA paper I showed two slides ago, again showing that occult hypoxemia occurred in about 24% of Asian patients, 26% of black patients, so we're talking about one in four patients here, 28% in Hispanics, but notice that in whites, it also occurred in about 23% of patients. So occult hypoxemia using pulse oximetry in other words, where the pulse oximeter shows the patient is not hypoxemic when they truly are hypoxemic is an issue. It is a greater issue in individuals who are Asian, Black, and Hispanic, but it occurs a fair amount of the time, 23% of the time, even in whites. And interestingly, in this study, they also showed that higher rates of occult hypoxemia were associated with mortality, organ dysfunction, and abnormal laboratory results. So this is not a benign issue. So occult hypoxemia related to overestimation of oxygen saturation by the pulse oximeter is not benign, not the least of which it can be associated with increased mortality. Now, so far, we've talked about pulse oximeters that are used in the hospital. What about the cheapo devices that you can buy on Amazon or at Walmart or at your neighborhood CVS or Walgreens? What about those? And there are a bunch of them out there. So this is a screenshot that I did when I was preparing this lecture about a month ago. These are all kinds of devices you can buy on Amazon for the most part, for less than 20 bucks. So how accurate are those? It turns out not very accurate, as you might expect. So this is a study by Brady Scott's group that we published in Respiratory Care a couple of years ago, showing that smartphone pulse oximetry devices cannot be recommended as a replacement for medical devices. 
So the devices that you might get that you can use with your iPhone or your Android device, not very accurate. Now, in another study, this was published uh, a number of years ago, back in 2016, they evaluated a lot of these low-cost devices, like the devices you can get on Amazon. And interestingly, they found that some of them performed reasonably well, but others of them performed very poorly. And the problem is, for your neighbor, who has just been diagnosed with COPD, who goes to Amazon and orders a pulse oximeter, he or she is not going to know whether they're getting a good one or a bad one. And if they get a bad one, that could result in adverse patient outcomes. Now, the other thing that ha has happened over recent years is pulse oximeters can now measure a lot more than just oxygen saturation. They can measure carbon monoxide saturation, carboxyhemoglobin. They can measure methemoglobin. They can measure respiratory rate. So how accurate are these devices at measuring carboxyhemoglobin, for example? So should we put one of these in every firehouse and on every ambulance to screen for carboxyhemoglobin? Well, you might think twice about that. Here's a paper we published 10 years ago in respiratory care looking at the accuracy of carboxyhemoglobin measured with a pulse oximeter. And at least in this study, there are very wide range of accuracy of these devices. Limits of agreement, very wide. So the concern is that a patient could have a carboxyhemoglobin of 15, not very good, but one of these devices could report out a carboxyhemoglobin of eight, where the difference might be, you're thinking about maybe putting the patient in a hyperbaric chamber versus just some 100% oxygen for a couple of hours. Some of these devices now also measure respiratory rate. So from the pulse oximeter, plethysmographic waveform, they are able to extract respiratory rate. Uh, to my knowledge, this has not been studied a lot in the literature. I think this is very intriguing. I think respiratory rate is a vital sign that we don't pay enough attention to. Uh, but we need to learn more about the accuracy of pulse oximeters measuring respiratory rate. So pulse oximeters are really very, uh, uh, they're very, uh, I think they can be very useful devices. They can measure more than just oxygen saturation. They also measure heart rate, as we know. But as clinicians at the bedside, we need to appreciate the inaccuracies of pulse oximetry and the clinical implications of that. So please, I'm not saying that we should not use pulse oximetry. Every one of us should use pulse oximetry in their practice. Not for a minute of I'm, am I saying we should, we, we should stop using the pulse oximeter, but we need to be able to use it wisely and to understand some of its limitations. So let's shift focus now away from pulse oximetry and talk a little bit about capnography and specifically to talk about end tidal PCO2 measurements. So what is shown here is a typical capnogram that we might get from a capnometer or cap, uh, a capnograph. Uh, and what I really want to focus on this morning is not so much the shape of the capnogram, but the end tidal PCO2. And I want to talk a little bit about whether we can rely on the end tidal PCO2 as a reflection of arterial PCO2. And again, make it clear, I'm not saying we should not use capnography, but when we do, we need to consider the physiology and the kinds of things that I'm going to lay out on the following slides. <clears throat> 
So then how well does the end tidal PCO2 reflect the arterial PCO2? Well, if we have a normal ventilation perfusion relationship within the lungs, if we have normal lungs, as I suspect is the case of all of us in this room, the end tidal PCO2 pretty closely reflects the arterial PCO2. They're within a couple of millimeters of mercury of one another. But the issue is that we don't use, typically, capnography in individuals who have normal lungs. We use it in individuals who have sick lungs. So if an individual has a low VQ relationship, alveoli with a low VQ, now the end tidal PCO2 reflects perhaps more closely the mixed venous PCO2. So in this case, the end tidal PCO2 will be a little bit higher than the arterial PCO2. So there's a myth out there that the end tidal PCO2 will always be less than the arterial PCO2. That's not true. Depending upon the VQ, the end tidal PCO2 could be a little bit higher than the arterial PCO2 because the mixed venous PCO2 is about five millimeters of mercury higher than the arterial PCO2. What if the ventilation perfusion relationship in the lungs is increased? Another name for this is dead space. So high VQ is dead space. What if your patient has a high dead space? Now the end tidal PCO2 may more closely relate to the inspired PCO2, and the end tidal PCO2 might be a lot lower than the arterial PCO2. And as all of us know, when we use capnography, during cardiac arrest, where there is no blood flow but ventilation, very high dead space, as high as you can get, what is the end tidal PCO2? It's zero. And then we start doing compressions, and the end tidal PCO2 goes up. And then we do compressions better, and the end tidal PCO2 goes up. And then we shock the patient, and their heart starts beating, and the end tidal PCO2 goes to 40. Right? You've probably seen that during cardiac arrest. So if there's dead space, if there is a high VQ, dead space, the end tidal PCO2 might be a lot lower than the arterial PCO2, and with cardiac arrest, it will be zero if there's no blood flow. And that's why we use capnography during CPR, because we use capnography, end tidal PCO2 during CPR, not to assess ventilation, arterial PCO2, but to assess perfusion, blood flow, VQ. As you can tell, I love physiology. So I can't talk about any of these things without talking about physiology. And in fact, it has been shown in this paper we published a number of years ago on respiratory care and other papers that as the dead space increases, the difference between the arterial and the end tidal PCO2 increases as well. So with a relatively normal dead space, the end tidal PCO2 is within a few millimeters of mercury of the arterial PCO2. But if we have a lot of dead space, like a VQ greater than 0.7, this is like a patient with severe COPD or severe ARDS. Now the end tidal PCO2 can be quite a lot lower than the arterial PCO2. So that's potentially concerning for a patient with COPD, for example, who you have on the ventilator, you're measuring end tidal PCO2. Because of the big difference between the arterial and the end tidal PCO2 because of the patient's dead space, the arterial PCO2 might be 60 and the end tidal PCO2 might be 30. And if you're not doing blood gases and just gone by the end tidal PCO2, for a PCO2 of 30, you would turn down the minute ventilation, right? And that would cause the patient to be even more hypercapnic. 
And I have seen this many times in my own practice. Patients with COPD on the ventilator, the end tidal PCO2 is less than normal. The arterial PCO2 shows a rather severe hypercapnia because of dead space. Again, this doesn't say that we shouldn't use capnography, but we need to use it wisely. We need to understand what the number means. And if you if your patient has an arterial PCO2 of 65 and an arterial PCO2 of 30, then you might say, wow, this patient has a lot of dead space ventilation. And that gives you some insights into the care of the patient. So again, Understanding the limitations doesn't mean that you stop using the technology. This is a paper from my group many years ago. Back in uh, 1991, we evaluated the use of capnography during weaning. And interestingly, what we found was that we found that there were a number of cases in which the arterial PCO2 went up, but the end tidal PCO2 went down. That is the yellow box. And we also showed that there were a number of cases in which the end tidal PCO2 went up, but the arterial PCO2 went down. So things trended in opposite directions. So sometimes what I hear is, well, I don't really believe the accuracy of the end tidal PCO2, but I think it's good for trending. Might want to rethink that. Might not be as good for trending as you think. In order for it to be good for trending, the physiology would have to be stable over time. And let's hope that the physiology is not stable over time because we're taking care of the patient and we're trying to make their physiology better over time. So I would say be a little bit concerned about using end tidal PCO2 to monitor arterial PCO2 during weaning because you might be misled at times. There are now a variety of different devices that we can use to monitor end tidal PCO2 in non-intubated patients either with nasal cannulas or with mask or during, even during non-invasive ventilation. The big, I think the big challenge from a technology standpoint here is avoiding the contamination of the sample with room air. So if we have an open system, as in a non-intubated patient or a patient who is on non-invasive ventilation, the big challenge is that if the sample is contaminated at all with room air, that will lower the PCO2 that is measured because there's zero CO2 in, in air. So to summarize a few things then about the use of end tidal PCO2 to assess ventilation, in mechanically ventilated ICU patients, which is where my expertise is, there's often a large difference between simultaneous measurements of arterial PCO2 and end tidal PCO2. And the reason for that is that many of these patients have a lot of dead space ventilation. There is co poor correlation between changes in arterial PCO2 and changes in end tidal PCO2. And in many patients, sequential paired measurements move in opposite directions. So I showed that from some data that I collected many years ago, and it has been shown in other papers as well. So using end tidal PCO2 for trending might not be as useful as we would hope that it would be. So end tidal PCO2, and this is the words of the author of this paper in the Annals of the ATS a few years ago, end tidal PCO2 should be used with caution, if at all, to assess adequacy of ventilation and the effect of ventilator changes in ICU patients. So we need to think about the limitations of this technology as it relates to physiology when we are using it at the bedside. 
Just a few words about transcutaneous PCO2. I think there may be another speaker who will be speaking to transcutaneous uh, more than I will, so I will leave that to them. Here, I think the technology has come a long ways over the last 10 to uh, 15 years. There have been a number of studies that have looked at now transcutaneous PCO2 in the ICU settings, these are ICU studies, uh, where I think transcutaneous PCO2 is really making some inroads is in the outpatient setting and in the clinic setting. But what these authors found in a paper published a few years ago is that bias is typically much larger for end tidal PCO2 and arterial PCO2 than it is between transcutaneous and arterial PCO2. So in other words, transcutaneous PCO2 may be a better reflection of arterial PCO2 than end tidal PCO2. There are, however, some technical disadvantages or limitations, so it takes some time for the initial sensors to stabilize, at least five minutes or so. There can be a lag in the response to changes in PCO2 due to the diffusion of CO2 through the skin, and there are periodic reca recalibrations that are required. But again, I would say that I think the technology here for transcutaneous PCO2 has improved a lot in recent years. I can remember when using transcutaneous PCO2, transcutaneous PCO2 was a real pain in the butt because of all of the issues with calibrations and site changes and so forth. And that, I think the manufacturers have done a good job in improving upon those things. Turns out that you can also measure transcutaneous PCO2 in fruits and vegetables. Who knew? So this was a paper that was published a couple of years ago as a joke but they measured transcutaneous PCO2 on apples and bananas and avocados and other things. And just in case you never knew, a normal transcutaneous PCO2 for a banana is about 20 millimeters of mercury. <laughs> a little bit of levity. Not always as serious as I seem to be. <laughs> so in summary then, the accuracy of pulse oximetry is about plus or minus 4%. So keep that in mind as you are using oxygen saturation measurements at the bedside. Pulse oximeter says 92, the true saturation might be 88, it might be, uh, it might be 96. And then think about how that translates to the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Over-reliance on pulse oximetry can lead to undetected hypoxemia. So the buzzword for that these days is occult hypoxemia. And that can result in worse outcomes. Not the least of which it can result in denying a COPD patient with hypoxemia long-term oxygen therapy, which we know is a life-prolonging therapy. And end tidal PCO2 more than 45 likely reflects hypercapnia, but not precisely, because the end tidal PCO2 is usually lower than the arterial PCO2. Transcutaneous PCO2 more closely reflects arterial PCO2 than end tidal PCO2, so maybe it's time to take a closer look at transcutaneous PCO2. Overall, I think blood gas surrogates are imprecise estimates of arterial blood gases. And finally, interpretation of blood gas surrogates requires an understanding of the underlying physiology. So if you use, and you all should use, the surrogates of blood gases, Bear in mind the physiology, bear in mind the pathophysiology, and be open to the possibility that things might be a lot different than the number might suggest. So with that, I will stop, and I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have.
Any tomatoes that you might want to throw? <laughs> or what's and I, the... I've stayed within my time, <laughs> yeah. even though I think the timer started about five minutes late, so we're still within our time. You are right. In fact, we have quite a, we have minutes for questions if anybody has any. Mike? Could you repeat that? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, is the difference in accuracy that was shown between manufacturers, could that also occur between devices of the same manufacturer, right? Mm -hmm. And I will extrapolate that even further to say, even if you use the same device, but if you change the, the pulse oximeter probe, will there be differences? And that is an excellent question, and I don't know that it's been studied. It may have, and I'm not aware, but that is an important question. So maybe somebody in this room could do that study and go to the AARC. It's too late for this year, it's next week. But for next year, I don't know where the AARC is next year, but next year, come and present that data at the open forum, and we'd love to publish it in respiratory care. So that, that is a provocative question, and I don't know the answer. But I think it is an important question. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So I would refer you to the paper that I showed. Dean, could you repeat the question? Yes. Please? So the question was, for the cheapo pulse oximeters, which brands are okay and which brands are not? I think that's your question. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and that was from this paper. So I would suggest that you look at this paper, Anesthesia and Analgesia uh, 2016, page 338. And in that paper, they have long tables where they show the accuracy of the various devices that they evaluated. The other thing is, bear in mind that this technology is, is fluid. So there are, I would imagine, a number of devices that they evaluated here that some don't exist anymore, and there have been others that have come onto the market. Wait, wait, question here? Yeah. For oxygen saturation in the stable as opposed to, uh, to a, uh, an exacerbation, because the data that I showed 94 to 98 was for COPD exacerbation. So like the stable patient who shows up for a routine clinic visit or who you might be seeing at home, uh, I would probably inch that up a little bit, uh, even in those patients, because due to the overestimation, the potential overestimation of the true saturation by the pulse oximeter, I would fear that that patient who is at 88, 89, they might actually have a saturation of 85, 86. So you might think about a little bit higher target even in the stable patients. Another question? That's exactly what I'm saying. And Did you repeat the question? Yeah, for so her question was, in those patients at home on non-invasive ventilation, we do a spot check of end tidal PCO2 by measuring from the mask, and maybe there are issues with room air uh, uh, contamination, so it might not be very accurate. And yeah, I think that is for sure correct, particularly if you are using a vented mask. Yeah, so that, 
So, so the problem is with a vented mask, you have the exhaled CO2 from the patient coming into the mask. You also have the fresh gas flow from the ventilator coming into the mask. That fresh gas flow has a PCO2 of zero. Yeah, so, and then if you're bleeding in oxygen as well, ouch. That could be a problem. <laughs> yeah, I would say, unless you can show me data otherwise, I would say be very careful about measuring end tidal CO2 in a vented mask on non-invasive ventilation. Very good question, thank you. Any further questions? We still have a few minutes. Sorry to come to East, Eastern Tennessee and stir the pot, but you know. <laughs> Sometimes the pot needs stirring. No further questions? Oh, Mike, have another one? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. The question was, if you were to follow end tidal PCO2, but also follow arterial PCO2, wouldn't that be a good reflection and changes in the physiology? And you are absolutely correct. But the problem is, we want to use end tidal PCO2 and stop using arterial blood gases. And that's where I think we get into trouble. So I think you are absolutely correct. I saw someone over here. Raise this hand. <laughs> okay, so the question is, what about venous blood gases versus arterial blood gases? So I had that in my lecture initially, and I took it out because I thought there's no way I'm going to stay within 50 minutes. I would be very careful about using peripheral venous PCO2 as a proxy for arterial PCO2. Uh, I know that particularly in an emergency department setting and now even in the ICU and out on the wards, there has been this big fascination with doing peripheral venous PCO2s and they can be very different than the arterial PCO2, particularly in sick patients. So I would, I would rail against that practice, as it sounds like maybe you were trying to do as well. Now, it might be different with a central venous PCO2. That's a little bit better. But that's not what is being done, right? They're doing hand PCO2s and and if you watch, you know, the individual, so usually they're not drawn by respiratory therapist. And if you watch the phlebotomist and the nurses not to pick on anybody who do these measurements and they have two cc's of blood and one cc of air in the syringe, it's just, you know, it's a mess. It would be higher. So the question is, would the venous PCO2 be lower than the arterial? It would be higher. And how much higher will be determined by perfusion? So with poor per peripheral perfusion, that hand PCO2 might be a lot higher than the arterial PCO2. Awesome. Any more questions?